and I feel like you know I'm doing this. I'll say something now, kind of knowing as I'm saying it that it's going to inspire fan art. <laughs> and so I'm really hoping for like a vintage tourism Joshua Tree of Vaginas poster. Shall we? I've got one. I'm ready. Okay, go. To do think it. About this. I mean, I've had like 18 months to think about this. So like, of course I have a tagline. It's been eight months, which is the length of the O.J. Simpson trial itself. So if you feel like it has been forever since we started telling this story, imagine how you would feel if you were sequestered for this whole time. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, you ready? Yes. Okay. Welcome to You're Wrong About, the podcast that takes you away from home, but always brings you back. Oh, hey. that's so good. You like knocked that one out of the park. I just heard the clean crack of the bat against the ball. <laughs> and this is like our 90th episode or something like that. Something and, like that. you know, we used to do one episode every two weeks and now we have one or two episodes Per week, and yes. I'm really enjoying it. And the majority of our correspondence is still about all the words that I'm mispronouncing. So <laughs> some things change, some things don't. Love it. Yeah. I am Michael Hobbs. I'm a reporter for the Huffington Post. I'm Sarah Marshall. I'm working on a book about the satanic panic. And we are on Patreon at patreon.com slash you're wrong about. And there's lots of other ways to support the show. And there's also ways to not support the show. And you can also support the show spiritually by yes. giving money to sex workers. Yes. Or whatever mm -hmm. else you want to support. And mm -hmm. we think that's chill and good. Mm -hmm. There you go. And today, oh my God. <laughs> We're talking about, like, the biggest, the most anticipated television event in the history of this podcast. We are finally talking about the infamous Bronco Chase. We are. I'm so happy. Don't you feel like we're a soap opera that has arrived at a wedding or something like that? <laughs> I was going to say, I feel like we're jumping the shark. Probably. But then I feel like at the end of this episode, people will feel uh, either satisfied or disappointed or whatever. And then yeah. they'll look up and be like, Oh, and then there's a trial, too, I guess. <laughs> I would love for you to think back <laughs> over just the previous nine episodes that we've done. And mm -hmm. just, like, just tell me what you think are salient points. Well, we followed OJ and Nicole's relationship as it became abusive and then more abusive and then culminated in him committing the murder of her and Ron Goldman. We've had Marsha Clark, who's a prosecutor and in the passenger seat of this investigation, but is trying to reach over and grab the wheel. Nice. And when last we left this story, OJ was basically amassing a big legal team to start fighting this. And I don't even know which episode we talked about this in, but he had departed on the Bronco chase with mm -hmm. his friend AC Cowlings planning to kill himself. Mm -hmm. And then they went to the place where Nicole was buried, but there were too many media there. And then he was going to kill himself in the car, but then AC sort of saw him and he decided not to. And that's where we left them, sort of in the midst of this long, slow, weird chase. Mm -hmm. Where they have been suspended for, for a very long time. Yes. Great summarizing. Yeah. And my plan after we're done with this episode is to take kind of an OJ hiatus and then pick up the story again in like a season two. Mm. And and so we're going to talk about what was going on in Bob Kardashian's house uh, immediately leading up to the Bronco chase. But cool. first, we're going to return to one of our Gospels, which is the Gospel of Paula. Mm. I mean, first of all, bring us up to speed about just who is Paula Barbieri and what do you remember about the way OJ kind of said goodbye to her before the Bronco chase begins. Paul Barbieri is OJ's girlfriend who he was seeing before the death of Nicole. He had basically decided to stop seeing her after all of this happened. Mm -hmm. I'm going to rewind and replay for you Paula Barbieri's goodbye scene with OJ as she depicted it, because I want to compare it then to what we learn according to a different source. Okay. So she says AC hands her like $2,000 in cash. And he says, OJ wanted me to give you this so you can get on a plane and go home. And OJ is walking Paula out to her friend Tom's Jeep. And Paula is saying, I love you. I love you. I'll be there for you. OJ opened the Jeep's passenger door, a gentleman to the end, I thought grimly. 
and closed it after me. I held my hand up to the window and OJ put his long fingers up to mine. Then OJ said goodbye to me in a way I'd never want to hear again. He reminded me of a boy I'd known back in high school, the class valedictorian and a rock-solid Christian. Whenever OJ claimed that all men cheated, I'd point to that young man as proof that he was wrong. Now you promised me something, OJ said through the closed window. You promised me that you'll get out of California and go back to Panama City and marry that guy back home. And then the car pulls away. It's very Casablanca, isn't it? It is. So, okay, we are now going to turn to An American Tragedy by Lawrence Schiller, which I am very excited to tell you uses many sources and is basically the book chronicling the defense team, but is most essentially the gospel according to Bob Kardashian. Oh. Who is Bob Kardashian? David Schwimmer. (laughs) Right. Okay. For those who don't know what that means, (laughs) help us out. (laughs) He's OJ's friend who is a lawyer, but not like a lawyer lawyer. (laughs) And he acts as OJ's personal life coach throughout this and is like tangentially on his legal team, but is not like a key member of his legal team. Yeah. Or he's like key in that he seems to be the one who is like OJ's kind of buddy. Yeah. And he is Kim's dad also. Yes. Kim Kardashian. Yes. Yes. And he's the first Kardashian. He's like the little <laughs> foot's mom of Kardashians. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you've been on a Don Bluth kick lately. Yeah, I really have. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Mike, would you like to hear about the David Schwimmer cameo in this? Really? Yes. What? Okay. I shall read to you now from Jeffrey Tubin's The Run of His Life, which tells us that Bob Shapiro is assembling a world-class team of experts for the defense team in the week following the murders. And so he does this um, wooing partly by flying them first class, putting them up in, I believe, the Beverly Wilshire <laughs> Hotel. Okay. If Bob Shapiro wants you on his defense team, he will give you the experience that Richard Gere gives to Julia Roberts and Pretty Woman. <laughs> and so one of the things that he does to charm a medical expert that he's just flown in and is trying to get on the defense team is that he takes him to the premiere of a new Jack Nicholson movie called Wolf. Okay. which has a role played by a very young actor at the start of his career named David Schwimmer. Oh! Isn't that so satisfying to know? Yeah. And then David Schwimmer will, of course, go on to play Bob Kardashian and the People vs. O.J. Simpson, the Ryan Murphy show. And the world will go on to forget the existence of the movie Wolf entirely. <laughs> Okay, so American Tragedy, the Lawrence Schiller book, has O.J. and Paula Barbieri standing in the side yard holding each other. I want you to leave, Simpson said. She was teary and defiant. I'm not leaving. I don't want you to see this. Look, I didn't do this thing. I love you, and I want you to stay strong. I'll be all right. AC has some money to get you back to Florida. They give her the money, and the book says Paula was crying but wouldn't get in the car. AC, give her the money and get her out of here, Simpson said, almost angrily. Kardashian and Cowlings, half escorts, half bodyguards, got Paula into the car. It was embarrassing. Hmm. Paula is depicting herself and OJ as having this fairly prolonged, sweet moment where he's like, you remember that guy you told me about back home? Find him. Marry him instead. And in this version, OJ is... Basically, just trying to get rid of her. Well, which one do you think is more plausible? I am inclined to believe the substance of what Paula is saying, but maybe not that it happened so nicely as she depicted it. Mm. You know, Mm. he's like, he's been pretty heavily sedated this week. Right. He's not making a ton of sense. He's seeming kind of affectless. Hmm. It's interesting that Paula writes a scene where he's able to really like show up for her. Right. But on the other hand... He's historically able to do that kind of thing kind of on autopilot. So, like, yeah, it seems likelier to me that, like, the men writing a book about, like, the defense team who seem, like, very uninterested in Paula generally, like, she's barely depicted in this. Like, Mm -hmm. I'm more ready to believe that, like, it happened, but that, like, Paula's version of it makes it maybe nicer than it was. Yeah. Or they had that conversation two days previously, and she's sort of porting it into the scene because it's like it's narratively more convincing that way. That's true, too. That happens a lot in memoir and in the way that we remember things like we unprompted will, I think, subconsciously kind of stitch together 
parts yeah. of different memories to make a coherent story mm-hmm. that kind of depicts the whole of a relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And if she's giving herself that moment at all inaccurately, then like, whatever. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So let's talk about what happens after Paula leaves. Okay. All right. So it's June 17th. OJ has been staying in Bob Kardashian's house that week because the media doesn't know where it is. And so they can't find him and surveil him. He Mm. left his house on Rockingham when he when he realized it was possible for the media to, like, take pictures of him and other people through the windows in the house, potentially. Mm -hmm. So the morning of Friday, the 17th, the house is woken up by Bob Shapiro calling to talk to Bob Kardashian, the two Bobs. Mm-hmm. are conferring. Bob Shapiro says, I've got bad news. They've issued an arrest warrant for OJ. He has to surrender by 11. And immediately Bob Kardashian, by his own account, is like, do you want me to tell him? Mm. And Shapiro is like, why don't you wait until I get there? So Bob Kardashian tells his fiance Denise, who tells him he should call AC to sort of get someone around to have like a cooling effect on OJ mm-hmm. because AC is is OJ's best and oldest friend. Mm-hmm. And Denise also is like, why don't you get the guns out of the house, Bob? And Bob is like, yeah, I agree. It's like, it's all kind of darkly funny because in this is an implicit acknowledgement that OJ has an insane temper and could blow up and do something violent and impulsive, which is exactly what he's being accused of in the murder of Nicole. It's a very good point, Mike. It's almost like an acknowledgement that OJ, yeah, could have done this. Like, we all kind of know. Yeah, what's what people seem to be describing is just this general, and maybe this fear that they themselves are not really trying to name, but of just like, oh, some various things could happen. Yeah. And so Bob Shapiro gets to Bob Kardashian's house. The two Bobs are united. They like, take their bob rings and put them together and are like form of gently delivering bad news <laughs> and then they go up to oj's room and bob shapiro is like oj the police have called me and you're gonna have to turn yourself in and according to kardashian oj just like basically doesn't react okay and Shapiro's like they're gonna charge you with double murder and you have to surrender yourself by 11 o'clock this morning and it's like nine and then bob shapiro says if you have anything you want to tell us oj this is the time Mm. this is the last time you are going to be alone with your attorneys with no eavesdropping oh and according to american tragedy oj says i've told you everything before i've got nothing to hide okay and then he starts talking about how He can't understand why they're not looking for other people. Obviously, these murders had to be committed by two people. Yeah, Colombian drug traffickers, Faye Resnick's (laughs) involved. We all know Uh the much more convincing Mm -hmm. version of this story. It was the Colombian drug traffickers that are after Faye Resnick. And anyway, so Bob Shapiro, I mean, well, okay, let's let's imagine you have Bob Shapiro's job in this moment. First of all, congratulations. And I'm sorry. (laughs) What do you do if you like you go up to inform your client and you're like, the police need you to turn yourself in in a couple of hours. They're going to charge you with double murder. So if you have anything to say to me before you go to jail, where you probably will be held without bail. Just please tell me now. And if your client immediately is like, I don't know why this is happening. Why aren't they looking for two people? I've already told you everything. Like, what What do you do? I mean, I struggle to put myself in the shoes of Bob Shapiro just because <laughs> so many... Because you wouldn't have taken this job <laughs> because you're like, why would I be doing any of this? Right. Like, first of all, I would be trimming my eyebrows. Secondly... <laughs> I would not be representing somebody like O.J. Simpson. Secondly, I'd be massaging whatever they put into catcher's mitts to make them supple on my (laughs) face. I mean, I don't know. I mean, isn't the whole thing with lawyering that, like, you have to believe your client, even if it's a little far-fetched? Well, yeah. I mean, Bob Shapiro is not mandated to use a defense dictated by what his client says. And initially, he's going to be like, OJ, what if we go for diminished capacity? That could work, right? And OJ's like, no. I need a lawyer who believes in my innocence. And like, that is uh, probably the most significant reason why Bob Shapiro gets pushed out and Johnny Cochran emerges as OJ's most important lawyer. Oh, But yeah, Bob Shapiro uh, alienates himself from OJ pretty early in the game. (laughs) 
by not being faithful enough to OJ's emotional realities, basically. Hmm. You know, at this point, you know, they spent a few days kind of talking. I think he can gather that OJ is like very attached to his version of events and that it's like um, integral to his identity that he's not Mm. the bad guy. Like that seems pretty clear Mm -hmm. and so i think that if i were bob shapiro i would be like i am not going to try and take this thing away from you because your whole self has been built around it yeah but then i'm thinking like a journalist right that's what journalists do i don't know if that's useful to a lawyer i mean this is basically me saying like if i were a lawyer that's what i would have done but i don't know if i would have been a very good lawyer yeah that's where i am too so i guess we have a good job for yes what we are (laughs) so anyway bob shapiro chooses the option of accepting OJ's response, being like, hmm, and then being like, I've got doctors and nurses on the way. We're going to take some blood samples and some hair samples. Okay. He just, he kind of changes the subject, which I feel like is the response of the person who doesn't know how to respond throughout time. Yes. As we remind ourselves every Thanksgiving. And so OJ also suddenly seems to remember something and is like, I've got to take care of my kids. I have to make some calls. And then suddenly he does start acting as if he might be preparing to shake off this mortal coil. Oh, okay. It's ambiguous because he could be preparing to go into jail, but he's also, he's writing these letters that are ambiguously suicide notes. They have some of the content of suicide notes, but they're not totally explicit. Mm. Before any of that happens, though, before OJ writes these notes that eventually are going to be read to the American people later that day, OJ finds a tape recorder of Bob Kardashian's and he starts recording a message on there, kind of like how Felicity on Felicity would send cassette tape journals to the Ginny Garofalo character. (laughs) We have a transcription of this in American Tragedy. I'm going to read to you from it. Okay. OJ says, oh boy, I don't know how I ended up here. There's apparently a long pause. And then he says, I thought I lived a great life. I thought I treated everybody well. I went out of my way to make everybody comfortable and happy. I felt very lonely at times in recent years, and I don't know what it is. I mean, I had a loving girl in Paula. My kids loved me. Everybody loved me. But I don't know why I was feeling so alone all the time. Look where I am. I'm the juice, whatever that means. But I felt at times like I was, ah, I felt goodness in myself. I don't feel any goodness in myself right now. I feel emptiness. I don't even know what I'm saying here. And the whole tape is about 10 minutes long. Oh, God. Thank you for not reading the whole thing. (laughs) It sounds like Michelle. Just these, like, long monologues with, like, these weird repeated phrases. Yeah. People are not very entertaining when they're in their depths. Yeah. And then he closes with, he seems to kind of return to public OJ at the end. He says, treat everybody the way you want to be treated and know your friends. Share your pain with your friends. If I had made one mistake right now, I'd realize that I didn't share my pain. And I think that's where I made my mistake. Oh, God. Please remember me as the juice. Please remember me as a good guy. I don't want you to remember me as whatever negative that might end here. What do you think about that? It's so boring. It's like so morose and self-pitying and completely at the same time refusing to take any responsibility for any of his own decisions that put him in this place. Like, why are you lonely? Well, I don't know, because you beat your wife consistently. For 18 years to the point where she hates you and it's hard to spend time with your kids now. Mm -hmm. Why are you lonely? Because you have a history of having these superficial relationships with people that are just built around you being a celebrity and no actual interest in them. Yeah, you've created a cage for yourself and it's really lonely in this cage. Yeah, I think it's like the authentic sadness of someone totally without perspective. Yeah, yeah. Because he's like, I am so sad. Because of what happened. (laughs) What's interesting is that, like, he seems to be in anguish, but, like, there's no direct evidence of guilt. Right. Like, he's very sad about, he's like, I don't feel any goodness in myself. Like, I don't feel like a good guy. And it's like, yes. Yes. You're not right now because you murdered people. So, yes, that identity has been taken away from you. But, like, is that... The reason that you're sad? Like, that's what remorse is supposed to feel like. Like, you're supposed to feel bad. It feels like Like. authentic evidence that he doesn't get it. Yeah. You know, that he's like, this is about me and my pain. And it's like, ah, it's not. But like, that's why you killed them in the first place. Yeah. Because your emotions, however fleeting, were bigger than like two people's right to continue existing. Right. 
It's also so funny how he's like, man, I, I, I just, I wish I would have talked about this more. And it's like, it sounds like he talked about it a lot and that he was really boring to hang out with. That's a good point. Like, You're right. He did. It's like, if only I had whined more. It's like, no, you, you whined plenty. Like that seems like the overwhelming experience of hanging out with you. If only I had called Cato <laughs> into the house more and then told him to watch football with me and then talked over the football. <laughs> and told every woman within five minutes who I wanted to date how lonely I was. Like if only I had like leaned in harder to the like, I'm lonely pitch. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay. So OJ does this recording and then he kind of does start doing practical stuff. Like he calls Nicole's parents and he's like, I want you to become guardians of our children. Mm. The medical experts come and start examining OJ because Shapiro wants them to photograph his body before he's taken into custody. Do you know why they're doing that? Oh, is that in case he's beaten by the cops? That's a really good guess. Uh, no, that doesn't come up. What they're doing is trying to take photographs of his body to show that he is uninjured, which they are going to argue is proof that he wasn't the assailant who killed Ron and Nicole. Oh, God. Because they're like, how could their killer have escaped unscathed except for this big cut on his right. finger, obviously. <laughs> except for the blood he was dripping <laughs> on his way home. Yeah, except for that. Ignore, ignore that. Right. They're, this is what I like about Bob Shapiro, though. Like, when he takes a job, he's like, bing, bang, boom. Let's get this defense team together. Let's fly people in and put them at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. Yeah. Let's do a second autopsy. Every hen house, dog house, tree house for 500 miles. <laughs> He's doing the Tommy Lee Jones thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I watched that movie a while ago and I was like, these men are in love. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, OJ, the doctors come to give him a physical and Bob Kardashian ever the practical friend is like um oj it's like almost 11 you need to turn yourself in to the police by 11 how do you think oj simpson reacts i want to say negatively <laughs> oj says according to bob kardashian's account why should i hurry what can they do to me but this is also kind of the weird thing that like they sent him a calendar invite for an arrest <laughs> Rather yeah. than making an arrest. I mean, this is what Marsha's been saying since day one, right? That like, why, why are you being like, well, if it's not too much trouble, OJ, can we go ahead and a uh, ding dong, arrest the diddly <laughs> do you for this? Hom diddly homicide. Yeah. We're talking about somebody who potentially killed two people. It's very weird that this is all, you know, like he has to go there to like pick up his lost watch or something. Yeah. OJ is like the LAPD are my pals. They come mm. over and use my tennis court. They ignore me beating my wife. Right. The law has never applied to me before. Why should it be now? Yeah. And Bob Kardashian apparently says, you're right. Take your time. What can they do? <laughs> He's like, yep. Yeah, good point. And Bob Shapiro is like, no, OJ, like we do, like my word kind of means something. Like I would mm. like the police to continue to believe me. Like I work with them. Right. So, yes, we do have to get you there by 11. Like, I'm sorry to ruin the fun. And so OJ apparently accepts this. Mm. And Bob Shapiro keeps being like, please hurry, because he wants OJ to arrive at Parker Center, quote, in his Mercedes, well-dressed, calm, dignified. Right. If an impatient police contingent found them in Encino, OJ would be hustled away in handcuffs like a common criminal. No one was willing to say the words, but they hung in the air. I mean, yeah, this is, he understands that this is a press event as well as a criminal justice event. Yeah. And that you need to produce images that are congruent with innocence and the perp walk thing, yes. which is bullshit in all circumstances. Yeah. Talk about the perp walk, actually, because some people don't hear those words and immediately have a clear mental image. Well, this thing where they basically parade a suspect from like whatever one building to another as they're in the middle of the arrest process and it's perfect for allowing the cameras to shoot them. Like these are the paparazzi photos we always see of suspects being marched from one place to another. Right. This is not something that they do in other countries and this is not something that America has done for a long time. Like this is something that is invented for the newspapers. This is not something that has to be a part of the criminal justice system. Yeah. And so it's essentially the police being complicit in the production of images that imply somebody's guilt, which makes things much easier for prosecutors. And so yeah. 
Bob Shapiro understands on some level that like I don't want my client to be front page of the newspaper looking like, yes, quote unquote, a common criminal. Yeah. And Bob Shapiro, of course, is absolutely right. And I love thinking about in the same way that I love thinking about Marsha Clark on the morning of June 13th being like, my desk is almost clean. And I feel like my life is like calming down. I love thinking about Bob Shapiro on the morning of June 17th being like, okay, OJ, just like really the last thing we want is for the police to have to come and pick you up and for the media to get images of you handcuffed being taken into Parker Center. Like that is the worst thing I can think of. Yeah. <laughs> Good thing there's no chance of some kind of nationwide media event that highlights <laughs> OJ's potential guilt. Yeah. So anyway, they're they're doing the exam. They're trying to keep the mood light. Bob Kardashian makes a joke that Reebok called and asked OJ not to wear their shoes for the arrest. Nice one, Bob. No one laughed. <laughs> so I love that Bob Kardashian and Kato Kalen are both the kind of like yeah. archetypal, like member of a big family jokester holder together of things. Yeah, the comedy waiters of our story. Yes. Yeah. And then... The police call again, and they put the police on with Saul Fairstein, the psychiatrist. They also put Saul Fairstein on the phone with Marsha. Like, they appear to just be passing the phone to him and being like, Saul, waste some time. Just mm. say some stuff. And so they put the police on with Saul, and he's like, I, I can't give you the address. I'm sorry. And the detective Saul is talking to says that they've issued an arrest warrant. So that means you're harboring a fugitive. Right. So Bob Shapiro takes the phone and finally gives them Bob Kardashian's address. And so the, the cops are coming now. Okay. So we've got a hard deadline. And like they've annoyed the police because the police want to have a press conference and be done with it. And they keep having to put it off. And so they feel that this is making them look bad. Which it is. Yes. Which it is. Also accurate. <laughs> and also, you know, it feels like it's OJ's denial, right? Like he has to also be like, uh, this isn't a serious matter. Right. And at this point, Bob Shapiro tells Bob Kardashian, like, the cops are coming. Get OJ ready. Get him to shower. Put him in a nice suit. You need to put him in the 90s pants that are way too big that everybody wore. <laughs> That'll make him look trustworthy. He's yes. got some huge dockers. Yeah. Massive dockers. So he sees off Paula, and then Bob Kardashian finds OJ sitting in the room where he has been sleeping, which is... One of Bob's daughter's rooms. Mm -hmm. This book doesn't specify. Um, in the Ryan Murphy show, it is Kim's bedroom. Oh. Picture a lot of scrunchies lying around. That's what I picture. <laughs> Bob Kardashian comes in and sees that OJ is holding a gun and feels that OJ is potentially going to commit suicide. And so he's like, let's pray, which seems like a good hostage negotiator slash killing time tactic. Yes. And But it doesn't really seem to work. And OJ is still talking about suicide. Finally, Bob Kardashian says, look, you know, it's between you and God. I think it's wrong. I don't think you should do this, but I can't do anything to stop you. As he talks, Kardashian wonders why he is so accommodating. Why isn't he stronger? Why doesn't he go after the gun? It's because he's played by David Schwimmer. But something else is at work here, an iron sense of fatalism. OJ is looking at two very bad choices. Either he kills himself, Kardashian assumes, or he goes to prison and endures unimaginable humiliation. To a superstar athlete who feeds off mass attention, public disgrace would be unbearable. Mm. And then begins this absolutely weird sequence where Bob Kardashian seems to be slowly trying to wind OJ down and talk him out of killing himself by finding fault with all of the places OJ picks in which to kill himself. Oh, so he's critiquing the logistics? Like, don't do it there. I'll, I'll read you some of the scene. First, OJ's like, I'm going to kill myself in this room. And then Bob's like, you can't. This is my daughter's room. That's fair. And then they go outside and OJ's like, well, maybe I'll do it here. Then he's like, no, these bushes are too close to the house. And then Bob <laughs> is like, okay, let's walk a little. This is like not funny, but it's darkly funny. Yeah, I feel like it is in the way of you're like, go Bob Kardashian. Like he just has to do such ridiculous stuff to try and play for time. And it yeah. feels like having a child who's like trying to run away. And you're like, don't forget to pack all these canned goods. Right. You will never make it with that. And you're like trying to figure out how to make the little suitcase too heavy for them right. to carry. Right. And so they're like outside the house. And Bob's like, why don't you kill yourself in the yard out here? That way you'd be away from the house a little bit. And then OJ says, I'd be baking in the sun. I don't want to bake in the sun. What? And at this point, he's actually kind of contradicting him. So he's kind of almost trying to talk him into it. He's like, 
you're not going to be here. You're going to be gone and your spirit will be gone. What do you care if you're baking in the sun? <laughs> and Oki's like, I just don't want to be baking in the sun. Wow. And so they're like, okay. Championship contrarianism. Or someone's like, I don't want to kill myself for this reason. And you're like, eh, that's not that good of a reason. It's it's very like, <laughs> it just feels very like a moment of, of true friendship. You know, yeah. whatever else you can say about the contents of it. We're like, they keep walking around and then Oki's like, I'll kill myself there. And then Bob's like, no, that's like right in front of the picture window in the living room. That way I can't sit in the living room without thinking about you right. killing yourself. You can't do it there. <laughs> this goes on for a really long time. <laughs> like, I'm, Yeah, like I feel bad for laughing, but it's really weird, right? Well, it's also actually very wise because my understanding is that what we know about suicide is that it's much more impulsive than intentional. And so if you can delay somebody from killing themselves for like a night, right. and oftentimes the impulse passes. Right. It's just like getting him through the moment. Yeah. And Bob's like, why don't you go to the Bel Air church? You were married there. And so he's like, great, I'll go there and kill myself. And so Bob Kardashian has been playing along to this point. But now that Simpson's like, yeah, OK, AC will take me there. Let's do this. Bob is like, no, we can't, we can't let this happen. And he's like, AC, we've got to stop him. And finally, Bob kind of like gives it up to God. He's like, you take care of him, AC. Like, you're in charge now. Mm. And then he's like, let's all take pictures. What? Like, they're at Disneyland? What is yeah, they're this? Playing, I think he's just playing for time. I think Bob Kardashian is just like, ah, pictures. <sighs> and then next he'll be like, Ovaltine. You can't leave without Ovaltine. <laughs> so they take these pictures. Now, Kardashian turns his back on his friend of 24 years. A man should be allowed to kill himself if he wants to, he growls to himself. Kardashian walks upstairs to rejoin the doctors. The police should be here any minute. His last act as a friend is to leave the athlete alone to define his life as he wishes. And I believe you might know what happens next. So they take these photos, Kardashian goes upstairs... And then the next thing they know, OJ and AC are gone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Bob Kardashian may have let his license lapse, but he's still enough of a lawyer to be like, well, I wouldn't know anything about anything that's transpired right. in the last 20 <laughs> minutes. Would I? <laughs> so then they're gone. The police show up. They're like, we'd like to take OJ in now. Mm -hmm. They look for him. They can't find him. They realize AC is gone too. Mm -hmm. And then the news breaks that he's gone. Mm. And let me actually, let me share some video with you now. Ooh, okay. So we're skipping ahead a little bit to when the white Bronco was first broadcast on the news because the first news helicopter to find the Bronco was piloted by Zoe and Marie Couture, mm -hmm. who were experienced helicopter journalists in LA. And helicopter mm -hmm. journalism was apparently a pretty robust field there because... Hmm. People in Los Angeles were used to televised car chases. Oh, right. And was something that I think people in the Los Angeles area were apparently used to at the time, but that nationally was weird for people. Hmm. Um, and so it was this kind of like novel thing where like something from L.A. suddenly like jumps to a national experience, which I guess also happens with like weird donuts and stuff. This was the first step in the path that led to those like Fox specials on like the most dangerous car chases or whatever oh yeah and and also you know the cops genre cops had been around yeah. for a few years at the time but this is like the rickety roller coaster that we are now trapped on yeah crime as entertainment crime as entertainment and also like the american viewers love of sort of the communal viewing experience and of processing news as a live event mm. and this is a really powerful example of this because this was you know first picked up by choppers in LA broadcast around the country. There was an NBA playoff game happening that, you know, what I'm going to show you is that game being cut into by this Bronco chase. And mm. then you can keep watching it in like the tiny TV, the picture in a picture, but it's very hard to follow basketball that way. <laughs> this was something that was deemed by various, you know, turners of, of whatever switches need to be turned for this to happen worthy of being seen by what turned out to be an audience of 95 million people. Whoa, that's a third of the country. Isn't that incredible? Whoa. For context, 
that year's Super Bowl audience was about 90 million. Oh, wow. So O.J. Simpson never made it to the Super Bowl. But if he had, he would have had a smaller audience than he had in this moment. Unbelievable. Do you have any memory of this? Because you were like 11. 12. Okay. Yeah. I remember my parents beckoning me to the TV to be like, look at this. I I didn't know who O.J. Simpson was or I, I had heard nothing of this. But I knew it was a huge deal because I remember we watched it for like uh, hmm. that evening. Yeah. And what do you remember seeing? Like, what did it look like? It's just this very boring footage of a car driving down the road with like this squadron of police cars behind it that in my memory are in like a flying V. But I think they're probably not in real life. I think at the time I thought he was going like 60 or 70 miles an hour. But I've since learned that he was going like 35 or something, that it was like not a high speed chase. Yeah. It's funny that it's called a chase because I don't know if it ever technically was. It's like they're following him. It's like a moving negotiation more than a real chase because he's not like speeding down streets trying to shake them. It's a moving standoff. Right. But anyway, yeah. So let's watch this footage. This is the Bronco chase. Just imagine you're a a sports ball fan, Mike. Mm. And this is what you're watching. Do you want to do one, two, three, go? Yeah, let's do it. Three, two, one, go. All right, we're seeing basketball. It's a red team and a white team. (laughs) Oh, black screen, special report. Special report. That beautiful 90s news graphic. I love that. California Highway Patrol is in pursuit of a white Ford Bronco. And it might contain OJ Simpson and a friend. It's, yeah, just helicopter footage of this car driving on an empty freeway. What does this remind you of? Because it reminds me of something very specific. Uh, Speed. The movie Speed. <laughs> That's probably not what you were thinking of. I was going to say it reminds me of watching the footage of September 11th and watching the news commentators talking as they're watching. Yeah. Because you can hear them processing in real time what they're seeing and what you're seeing. Right. They're just having to talk through stuff and to right. keep talking because that's their main job, apparently. I also love the weird inhuman speech patterns of announcers, TV announcers during these situations yes. where they're like, it's a car. It appears to be white. We think it's driving <laughs> on a freeway. I know. You can hear how empty that <laughs> language really is. We now have like what's five cop cars following behind him and are they in a v no unfortunately yeah it's funny because i have that mental image too and i don't know why like yeah. do i imagine that they're like geese <laughs> oh yeah there's now other cars on the freeway if you were trying to watch this basketball game i mean i can't even see the ball you know <laughs> And they just said O.J. Simpson's holding a gun to his head. Yeah. So the public has a lot of information, actually. Like, Mm. And they're getting accurate information. Like what's being reported turns out to be true, which is kind of weird for a situation like this, I think. Oh, so they think he's on the way to his mother's house. Okay. Yeah. O.J. is talking to the police. And then these news anchors are being told that O.J. is saying, I want to see my mother. Take me back to Rockingham so I can see my mother. Mm-hmm. That's his demand. Mm. Man, L.A. is big. He's been driving for ages. <laughs> okay, so they're, now they're talking about spectators. Right. And as we cut to a wider shot, you're going to start seeing people lined up, pulled over, and against that barricade that separates the different lane directions. And they're pulled over and looking at O.J. Oh, yeah. He says people are getting out of their cars and waving at O.J. Simpson. It looks like a parade, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, and look at that overpass. Do you see that? Oh, yeah. Wow. Packed overpass of people watching slash waving. This broadcast has been going on for 11 minutes, which means that (laughs) people have had 11 minutes to be hearing about this on the radio. See, look at all those cars. Yeah. They're seeing it on TV. They're figuring out where O.J. is going because they know where basically on the freeway he is and... They know that he wants to see his mother. So, you know, they know that he's going back to Rockingham, presumably. So they know where he's going to be passing pretty much. Yeah, it's like a marathon route or something. Yeah, exactly. It's it's like he's got the ball again. Yeah. Right. And he's running and he's he's got a, you know, wrong sport, but he's got to get home. Right. You can hear people cheering very faintly in the background. And I don't even know if that's from the basketball game or the OJ (laughs) footage. And and so the argument that we're going to see about OJ as a cultural figure basically from this moment forward is white people looking at the fact that there are people in the black community who everyone can see on TV holding up signs encouraging OJ to escape 
and going to the the sides of the freeway and trying to spot him and and cheering and supporting him. After these images are on the news, this tidal wave of reactionary white pundits who are like, "This is wrong. I'm I'm I see my high horse. I'm I'm getting it from the stable, and I am saddling mm. it up, my friends." <laughs> and I have no idea what the feeling was in the in various black communities at the time because I wasn't there. But my guess is that it's nice when you're used to the police just murdering people who look like you to have just one person, one black person who can say of the police, quote, why should I hurry? What can they do to me? Right. I mean, I can see why people knowing what we know about the LAPD at that time would have just instinctively not believed the police accounting of the events. Yeah. A knee-jerk disbelief of the police is no more illogical than a knee-jerk belief of what the police say. Yes. The police lie. The LAPD especially lie. Yeah. Like, even among police, they're known for lying and they're known for brutality. Right. And that's especially obvious to everyone because this is three years after the beating of Rodney King. Right. The vicious beating of a man for the crime of speeding. Right. Okay. I'm going to turn off the sound, but let the video keep going. Okay. So what do you think of all that? I think it was a big deal because the media made it a big deal. Right. Like, it's not like people were watching this basketball game and they were like, I don't want to be watching this basketball yeah. game. I'm going to call and demand this car chase. Right. Taking place in a city that I probably don't even know what I'm looking at or where it is or why it's significant. Right. Because the only reason that this is significant is because of his celebrity. Mm -hmm. That I imagine there are chases like this in LA relatively frequently and we don't interrupt NBA finals for them. There are much better chases in LA. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really the the actual story here is like troubled celebrity wanted by cops, which is really not a national story. But that's, you know, that's the entire dynamic of the O.J. Simpson trial from day one, right? Is that it was never really all that unique of a story. It was simply two things that Americans love, celebrities and crime. So do you think that this is like that the media made this a story? I mean, we've had other celebrities like we had Phil Spector, who was accused of crimes that I am not super familiar with the details of. I believe murder. I think I also think murder. And I'm the reason I'm not familiar with that is because it wasn't a massive media frenzy for a year. It was just like a really sad story. Yeah. <laughs> and so you can imagine OJ being treated the same way. What's interesting is OJ was not even that big of a fucking celebrity. He was retired. He had had bit parts in the naked gun. Yeah. Like surely a lower level of celebrity than like recording Be My Baby. Right. It's like pretty incredible that the network's dedicated, I don't know, four hours to this. This is like an hour. Okay. But yeah, an hour of like, and we're watching it and like, you're like, this is boring. Yes. <laughs> There's literally nothing remarkable about this car. Right. I mean, you can imagine this not being on TV and the O.J. Simpson trial playing out differently. Oh, yeah. You know, it would have been in the newspapers, but you can imagine it being like page 12, page 13, not this national media obsession. I think so much of what ended up happening was set by this template of interrupting an NBA Finals basketball game for, which is a pretty big deal. People love basketball. Yes. If you show something to almost 100 million people and they all experience it together, then like when it shows up in the news again, like when that person is in the news again because he's going to trial, you know, then people will be like, I remember that. Yeah. And like, it's significant to me. Like I was part of it. And yeah. therefore, I'm invested. So, like, let's watch this trial. Yeah. Like, how much of it was that? I think that's a very important question. Right. I think we, we were starting to have both the mercenary quality of broadcast media and the technological capability in a way that allowed us to have more and more live spectacles like this. Yeah. Do you want to know what's going on inside the car? Yeah. What do we know about that? So... Shortly after OJ and AC take off, OJ, who has a cell phone with him, calls Nicole's dad, who was at Nicole's condo, mm -hmm. going through her things. And OJ's like, I'm going to come by. And Nicole's dad is like, OK. And then he calls the police. Mm. So by the time OJ gets to Nicole's house, the police are already all over the place. And so he spots them from far away and avoids the area. And okay. from there, he heads to her grave. Mm. And again, there's too much heat there. So he he avoids it. 
Mm-hmm. District Attorney Gil Garcetti holds a press conference okay. and says, you can tell that I am a little upset and I am upset. This is a very serious case. Many of us perhaps had empathy to some extent. We saw perhaps the falling of an American hero. To some extent, I viewed Mr. Simpson the same way. But let's remember that we have two innocent people who have been brutally killed. I find that interesting. Yeah, it's weird that he's empathizing. You don't get that a lot at like, we're looking for this suspect press conferences. Yeah, talk about that, Mike. Find Figure out what's at the bottom of this tote bag. It's strikingly different language than they use when they're looking for like the DC sniper or somebody else. Like, yeah, they're pure evil. And we're looking for someone who's the personification of every single thing that we hate. And it's basically not like a human that we're looking for. It's like this beast that we're chasing down. Because who the figure of the killer is if the district attorney is having a press conference. Well, it's like, it's weird to put the killing of two innocent people after the butt. (laughs) It's like, this is a nice guy. And he used to play football and he's going through a lot of stuff. But, you know, we got these two dead people. Yeah. It's interesting because just looking at, you know, the way I feel about the way crime is covered in the media and how upsetting I find it that as soon as you have someone who's arrested or someone who emerges as a suspect in a crime, they are immediately used to promote tough on crime policy. Mm. So as someone who just hates to see those narratives played out over and over again so rotely, and they always are, you know, again and again, I agree with you. You know, I have the response that I think people had at the time of like, oh, this is intriguing. Like, is this could this be fair? (laughs) It's like, wait, you're allowed to talk about the fact that you see the alleged murderer is human. Like you're allowed to do that in your job as district attorney. (laughs) And like, I know you're allowed to do that because of the very specific kind of celebrity of this defendant. But like, imagine how you might feel if you did this more often. This is like the way vegans feel when like, you know, they take you out for a vegan (laughs) meal and you're like, that was really good. And I feel really great. And I enjoyed that. And they're like, yes. What if you felt this way more often? I mean, it's also the power of wealth, right? It's like wealth and celebrity. It's wealth and celebrity are the only forces that can overcome race. And it's not just any kind of celebrity. It is like the fact that like there are, are countless white men who grew up truly loving OJ Simpson, right? And like maybe no one else, maybe like they, they feel no positive feelings for any other black person ever, but maybe they do feel that for OJ Simpson because he managed to be that for them. It is interesting thinking about the ways in which his celebrity is specifically coded as appealing to men. Yes. Because we do get a lot of these like the American tragedy of the sports star brought down in these yes. almost like Shakespearean tones when it comes yeah. to OJ. The great man brought down. Yeah. But then we tend not to have those same narratives of like women when they fuck up. Right. It's clear that the emotions of the men who are running media organizations is wrapped up in all of this. This is like the intersectionality of this whole media event because you have like He is a man who is loved by other men. He is a black man who is loved by white men. And he is a man who is loved by men. And the fact that men have this feeling of love and adulation for him means that they appear to be willing to kind of brush aside the fact that he appears to have murdered his wife. Right. All right. The LAPD have a press conference. Gil Garcetti has a press conference. And then Bob Shapiro has a press conference. Everybody has a press conference. His is at Mm. 5 p.m. So Bob Shapiro begins his press conference by talking directly to OJ and says, for the sake of your children, please surrender immediately. Mm. And as, you know, being calm and and being his his Bob Shapiro self. And also maintaining this idea, because he's also playing to the cameras to some point, too. So he also wants to reinforce OJ's innocence at this point. Yes. And also reinforce his own competence, because then he's talking to the cameras and he's like, I have arranged many situations where some my defendant has to turn themselves in. And for example, I arranged the surrender of Eric Menendez. This is going on his show reel. <laughs> and it is at this point that Bob Kardashian reads OJ's letter to the press and public. Mm-hmm. I'm not I, I'm not clear on his decision making process. Mm-hmm. Like he doesn't even know if OJ is alive. He doesn't know where he is. Bob Kardashian apparently is pretty convinced that OJ could very likely be dead right now. Mm -hmm. And then also, I feel like if he thinks, you know, well, maybe OJ is alive, then he could also be reading it from the perspective of this is going to make my friend look more sympathetic, I think. Okay. But anyway, 
Bob reads the letter, which begins, First, everyone understand I had nothing to do with Nicole's murder. And Bob Kardashian reads, I've had a good life. I'm proud of how I live. My mama taught me to do unto others. I treated people the way I wanted to be treated. I've always tried to be up and helpful. So why is this happening? Oh, God. Nicole and I had a good life together. All this press talk about a rocky relationship was no more than what every long-term relationship experiences. All her friends will confirm that I've been totally loving and understanding of what she's been going through. Not true. At times, I felt like a battered husband or boyfriend. Oh, my God. But I loved her, made that clear to everyone, and would take whatever to make us work. God, he had to throw that in, didn't he? Yeah. You know, sometimes I felt like a battered husband because, like, she's so terrible. But anyway, yeah, she's recently died, and uh, I didn't do it. It's like, really, dude? You can't just skip that? Claws one time. Yeah, he couldn't not say it. I felt like a battered husband. Unbelievable. Yeah. And so he concludes with, don't feel sorry for me. I've had a great life, made great friends. Please think of the real OJ and not this last person. Jesus Christ. Thanks for making my life special. I hope I helped yours. Peace and love, OJ. And then inside the O and the OJ is a happy face. It's like an L Woods move. I think that's how he signs autographs. Oh, okay. And so... As Bob Kardashian is preparing to read this letter at this press conference, he's nervous, obviously. And Bob Shapiro was like, just read slowly. Jack Nicholson has made a fortune off of speaking slowly. <laughs> I'm really interested in Bob Shapiro's like Jack Nicholson interest. Like, I, and I also love that he apparently watched Wolf the night before, which is a movie where Jack Nicholson is a werewolf. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, Bob Kardashian is like, how do I read this letter? And Bob Shapiro is like, just, you got to do a Nicholson. Just, I, he sold me on that werewolf man. <laughs> so they read the letter and then they take questions. And then one reporter asks, why did Bob Kardashian read the letter at all? Fair question. Because it doesn't make OJ look very innocent. Yes. And Bob Shapiro says, we read it because it is the only words that we have from OJ. Jeffrey Tubin says, this answer says much about the care and feeding of celebrity clients. OJ wanted it done, so it was done. Jeffrey Tubin does not like any of these people. <laughs> and someone asked, what are the last words he heard from OJ? And he said, my personal words with him were of a complimentary nature to the way I had been with him and for him to thank me for everything I had done up to date. <laughs> He's like, always be selling, Bob. You know what? He said that my rates are really low and I'm always on time. <laughs> And so after the press conference, Bob Kardashian goes back to Rockingham, okay. which is being guarded by officers. And they're like, we can't let you in. And he's like, I'm OJ Simpson's doctor. And they're like, OK. Doctor? Yes. <laughs> and so they let him in and he goes to talk to Jason and Arnell, OJ's children from his first marriage. And he's basically like, I'm going to level with you guys. OJ loves you. He wants you to have all the money you need. And so based on all that, it's his opinion that their dad is going to kill himself rather than go to jail. Whoa. He just tells them that? He apparently really thinks that's going to happen. Yeah. Whoa. Because he's breaking it to them like as news pretty much. Whoa. And Jason like panics and, yeah. you know, runs away and starts to cry. And Arnell just sits there just staring at Bob, silently crying. And he's like, your father loved you so much. And he just felt he had to do this. And then one of the other family members who's there, you know, they have the TV on, is like, wait a minute. Yeah. There he is. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That's... <laughs> I don't know if that's funny or just ironic or what, but my involuntary reaction is to laugh at that. It's dark. <laughs> it's really dark and weird. And then... Jason apparently is, you know, he comes out of the bathroom where he's been crying and is like, come on, dad, come on. So like everyone knows what this is. He's making a run. Mm. So at 2 p.m. that day, the LAPD has put out an all points bulletin. And as we talked about before, there is a couple that are on the road at about 630 heading north on I-5 when they see the white Bronco and they mm. call it in. Their names are Kathy and Chris. Thank you, Kathy and Chris. And so at the same time, Detective Larry Poole is heading north on I-5 when he also sees a white Bronco and then quickly reads the plate, radios it in, is like, oh, hey. So he pulls up to where he's driving alongside Al Callings. Al looks at him and 
according to American Tragedy, smiles nervously. I'm imagining like a Bugs Bunny, like cartoonish shrug. Like, I don't know (laughs) what I'm doing. (laughs) Here I am, officer. And then another cop car shows up. And then to quote from American Tragedy, the Bronco stopped in heavy traffic at Grand Avenue in Orange County. Cowlings glanced to the side and saw two guns pointing at him. All he heard was the deputies ordering him to cut his engine. Cowlings started screaming, swearing, yelling no, and pounding his fists on the door. The blows were so violent the Bronco shook. The traffic cleared at Grand Avenue and the officers found themselves behind Cowlings again, traveling down the freeway. The chase had begun. Cowlings dialed 911. And he says, this is AC. I have OJ in the car. Right now we're okay, but you've got to tell them just back off. He's still alive, but he's got a gun to his head. Let me get back to the house. And and they do. Mm. They've basically made a demand and are having it met by the police. Mm -hmm. It's also worth noting. I mean, it's so easy to forget in the midst of what this became, but it's worth pointing out that like this all worked out peacefully. Like he did peacefully surrender to the police and like. I think, you know, the excitement of watching this was that people didn't know how it was going to end. And like, yeah, nothing was happening, but maybe something would happen. Right. It's like watching the Indy 500 or like something <laughs> terrible could happen or it could just be really boring. <laughs> and whatever happened was going to end up on TV. Yeah. So the news shoppers find the white Bronco. Did they get that from the radio scanner? How did they find that out? Oh, I can I can uh, I can tell you exactly. So. Zoe Turr and her wife, Marika, who kind of are the pioneers of L.A. freeway chase helicopter news. Zoe and Marika have the same hunch that various members of OJ's defense team have, which is that he has gone to the cemetery where Nicole has buried. Mm -hmm. And so they take their KCBS chopper to the cemetery. They notice that the cops have staked out the cemetery. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, "Okay, so... He probably is avoiding a stakeout, but let's sort of check Mm. out the area. And so that is when they spot OJ and start broadcasting a live image of the Mm. Bronco. And then other helicopters also join in. And so not only does he have this phalanx of police cars following him, but he starts to have just this flock of helicopters following him as well. And that's when we lose our basketball. (laughs) And that's when we lose basketball. Yeah. And then we have various news anchors and media personalities kind of trying to follow along and explain what's happening. And people who don't know L.A. geography very well are kind of lost. Larry King is talking about this live. He had really thought that North Korea would be the big news story that week. And he did okay. not think that his acquaintance O.J. Simpson would stay in the news <laughs> for very long. But he was <laughs> wrong. And so because he's doing his show from L.A., but he really doesn't know the city well at all. He has a Los Angeles atlas brought to him as he's narrating (laughs) the case so he can like see where this is going right like where on the tic-tac-toe board of freeways this is people who know the geography as they're following along are speculating that al callings is going to get off the san diego freeway at the sunset boulevard exit Mm -hmm. which is then going to take him to oj's house at rockingham Mm -hmm. which he does do and then i'll read to you from the run of his life Cowlings indeed left I-405 at sunset. Then he dodged traffic for about a mile until he could make a right turn onto the privileged hilly precincts of Brentwood. With the helicopter still tracking him among the gated homes, Cowlings then made a left onto Ashford, from which he could turn into OJ's driveway. Cowlings, however, almost didn't make it. There were so many television satellite trucks parked on tiny Ashford that Cowlings had to slow to nearly a full stop to inch his way past them. Whoa. With dusk fast approaching, Cowlings finally managed to pull into the driveway at 360 North Rockingham. The Broncos' flashers illuminated the cobblestones in the driveway, from which, earlier that week, police had scraped blood samples. It was shortly before 8 p.m. So, Detective Tom Lang, who we've heard from quite a bit in previous episodes decides to have the LAPD's SWAT team go to Rockingham while OJ is still on the road Mm -hmm. and prepare to take him in. Okay. So they have a team of about 25 guys waiting for him there. Wow. All of OJ's people are sent away except for his son Jason Mm -hmm. and Bob Kardashian. And the LAPD also invited a photographer for Time and Life magazine. Oh, my God. Oh, Jesus Christ. So it's just the essentials. It's your eldest son, 
your oldest friend, a SWAT team, and a photographer for Time Magazine. <laughs> it's amazing how both the lawyers and the cops are deliberately using the press. Mm -hmm. Once again, we're getting a tasting sampler yeah. of all of this. So when Al Cowlings and OJ pull into Rockingham, Jason immediately appears at the front door mm -hmm. and is upset and yelling at Al Cowlings and running toward the car. Mm -hmm. And Al Cowlings reaches out and pushes Jason away. Mm -hmm. And so, according to Jeffrey Tubin, a couple of police officers come and basically drag Jason back into the house. And Al Cowling says of OJ, he's got a gun. Don't do anything stupid. Get the police away. And so, again, we're in this standoff situation where the fugitive is making demands and the police are actually somewhat interested in negotiating. Right. The famously soft hand of American SWAT teams. <laughs> Whatever you need. Yeah. Do you need a back rub? So meanwhile, it's getting dark. These news helicopters are hovering above OJ's house, still trying to get their footage. Mm -hmm. Cato, the dog who has been at Rockingham, is, is wandering around. And so for a while, the only footage that the helicopters have is just of this dog walking around in the driveway. <laughs> and so the LAPD has a negotiator talking to OJ. And... OJ says, I want to speak with my mother. That's my demand. And at that moment, the battery in OJ's phone goes dead. Nice. So Al Callings leaves the car, goes into the house to get a new cell phone for OJ. And it is at this point that OJ decides to call it. It's 8.53 p.m. Mm. They've been in the driveway for nearly an hour. Um, the chief of the SWAT team is like, all right, you're going to have to step out of the car and surrender yourself. And OJ does. Mm -hmm. What Tubin says is he staggered into the foyer and collapsed into the officer's arms. I'm sorry, guys, Simpson kept repeating. I'm sorry I put you through this. And so they let him use the bathroom. They give him a glass of orange juice and he calls his mother. And then after he talks to his mother, the officers ask OJ if he's ready to go. And he says he is. And then they put handcuffs on him and start to take him to Parker Center. Hmm. However, the police have told the news helicopters that they are not allowed to shine any lights on the scene. Okay. And so it's dark outside. No one sees OJ with handcuffs on him being oh. taken out of the house by the police. No one sees him being perp walked. Ah, so we didn't get the image of him being walked out of the house in handcuffs, even though it happened. Mm -hmm. So is this where we're going to leave OJ for now? This is where we leave him for now. Mm -hmm. And he's going to be taken into Parker Center and booked, and he will be in jail until the end of his trial. So for the next 15 months. Mm. And uh, to trial we go. Yeah. And I want to pause here for a while now that we have completed this chase and... We're going to return to the story for, I guess, kind of season two after a hiatus. Okay. And yeah, I guess, I don't know, Mike, I would close for now, though, by asking you, like, would the story of the trial be as big without the story of the Bronco chase? Like, if we hadn't all shared that as Americans, would we have been so excited to share more? I mean, we'll never know, but I, I believe so. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just think that the lack of police brutality is really striking in this story. Yes. I mean, the amount of leeway, even in this situation, that the police are giving him is remarkable. Like, here's some orange juice, OJ. Like, What does it suggest about what, like, how they see him? Like, yeah. What kind of person do you treat this way? I mean, in other scenarios, American SWAT teams are so vicious that you can call anonymously and have a SWAT team sent to somebody's house and they will kill that person on no other information. Like, there's a reason why swatting is a thing in America and it is not a thing in other countries. The SWAT teams will come in and kill people's dogs, kill people's partners, kill people's kids. Mm -hmm. And then now we've got a SWAT team just, like, hanging out in OJ's house. Like, yeah, use the bathroom. Don't forget to wash your hands. Yeah, whenever you're ready, OJ. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. It is. And it's also, it suggests to me that, like, they cannot bring themselves to truly fear him. Yeah, or to see him as other, right? Because othering is so important to American policing culture, right? That like the normal rules don't apply. Yeah. I just find it inspiring, you know, because the police <laughs> are just like, 
we just are doing our best. And it's like, you say that, but remember a time when, when you had a suspect and you, you really decided to not kill him and you didn't <laughs> remember that. Remember what happens when you put your mind to something? Imagine all the people, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but just like, I mean, it's my dream that every defendant is treated like OJ Simpson. I want everyone yeah. to have a Johnny Cochran. And if they want, I want everyone to have a Bob Shapiro who, and you know, is useful for a brief period and is like yeah. putting up potential defense witnesses in the freaking Beverly Wilshire. Right. To me, the story of OJ has always been, there's just so much happening here. There's so many stories that were lost at the time and that we get to revisit now. There's so many forms of injustice taking place. But at the end of the day, I'm just like, let's just, let's order the OJ special for everybody. Let's make yeah. that like the like the standard menu. It's easy if you try. (laughs) 